Rocket engines are incredibly complex machines, pushing the boundaries of materials, science, and human ingenuity with a multitude of different engine cycles that characterize the engine. And even if you're confident that you've learned and read countless books about the rocket engines of the world, it's still not enough to understand theory. You have to look at a rocket in real life, in front of your face especially SpaceX's Raptor. Now, Raptor's 2.0 variant has leaked, giving us a glimpse at genius engineering by Elon Musk that shocked the industry. For a long time since the beginning, the starting sequence of the Raptor is still a huge secret that is safeguarded by SpaceX. Recently, in a tweet, everyday astronaut shared a sneak peek of their animation at the heart of the video about the startup process of the RS-25 and where it originated from. Interestingly, this has attracted the attention of SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk himself, who replied, Raptor's start sequence is, and I believe those are two clown emojis, signifying that it is quite bonkers. Tim Dodd also admitted that after finally having some small grasp of the RS-25, I still can't even imagine Raptor. The timing has to be precise to thousands of a second in order to get everything right between the two systems. I just can't even imagine. Impressive engineering. Obviously, there are many toned questions about what's inside Raptor. SpaceX's Raptor design is so simple in comparison to RS-25 or the SSM E, but that's where the confusion lies. For example, the Raptor doesn't have an LP fuel or oxygen pump. What's even more surprising, if we are to compare the oxygen pressure gain before and after the pump, RS-25 has a 100 PSIA of 6.89 bar inlet pressure from the tank. The LP pump raises it to 421 PSIA, which is equivalent to 29.03 bar, and the HP pump further raises it to 4,025 PSIA, putting it at 277.51 bar. Finally, an additional boost pump raises it to 6,939 PSIA, or 478.42 bar. And the fuel-rich oxygen HP preburner burns at 4,812 PSIA, which is around 331.77 bar. On the other hand, the Raptor intakes at 3 bar and raises it to 633 bar to burn in an oxygen-rich preburner at 564 bar with just a single centrifugal stage. I wonder what SpaceX's secret solves for such a large single-stage pressure ratio without surging. Regardless, we can put our trust in SpaceX's Raptor, because in another tweet on the same day, Musk revealed, Raptor start is now reliable on the test stand under most conditions. Now we're working on dynamically adapting the start sequence based on increasingly difficult propellant inlet pressures and temps. Operating with low pressure, warm liquid oxygen is particularly important. In the past, the difficulty with the Raptors has been in the autogenous pressurization temperature regulation, and the g-forces the tanks are being flown in. They haven't had much luck simulating those in software or the test stand. Autogenous pressurization worked in the shuttle because propellants were at their boiling point. With super-cooled propellants, the gas wants to turn back into a liquid instead of pressurizing the tank. There obviously isn't enough margin in the pressurization system to overcome the extra condensation caused by sloshing. The current pressurization and temperature regulation sounds mainly like an open-loop system. They launch it in just the right state so when the landing burn comes due, the tanks have warmed up just the right amount and condensed just the right amount from the ambient temperature over the predicted time. The progressive engine shutdowns in hover could be to minimize the sloshing. However, the new version of Raptor, dubbed Raptor 2, has a large number of performance and reliability improvements. On the original version of the Raptor, while SpaceX was learning how to control the engine, a very large amount of development sensors were needed, allowing them to track pressure and temperature throughout Raptor's plumbing. Additionally, many valves were combined into valve plates, helping further 
further simplify plumbing. By removing a large amount of these components, SpaceX has made the engine more flame and heat proof, a clear step towards SpaceX's goal of removing all engine shrouding from the booster, which would decrease the booster's mass by around six tons. This is a clear example of Musk's the best part is no part mantra. More impressively, SpaceX is now building a Raptor 2 engine per day. The Raptor rocket engine is crucial to Starship's success. 33 of these Raptor 2 engines power the super heavy booster that serves as the vehicle's first stage, and six more are to be used by the Starship's upper stage. For a successful lunar mission, these engines will need to relight successfully on the surface of the moon to carry astronauts back to orbit inside of Starship. If the engines fail, the astronauts will probably die. SpaceX has moved very quickly on development. Mark Kirisic, NASA's Deputy Associate administrator who oversees the development of Artemis missions to the moon said about Raptor. We've seen them manufacture what was called Raptor 1.0. They have since upgraded to Raptor 2. That first of all increases performance and thrust, and secondly reduces the amount of parts, reducing the amount of time to manufacture and test. They built these things very fast. Their goal was seven engines a week, and they hit that about a quarter ago. So they are now building seven engines a week. That is quite a high rate, likely making Raptor one of the fastest produced orbital class rocket engines in history. To put that into perspective, the Raptor 2 rocket engine produces approximately 510,000 pounds of thrust. This is almost identical to the amount of thrust produced by the RS-25 engine that will be used to power NASA's Space Launch System rocket, or is powering, I should say. This engine was designed and developed by Rocketdyne in the 1970s for the Space Shuttle program, and the company has decades of experience manufacturing them. Back in 2015, NASA gave Aerojet Rocketdyne a contract worth $1.16 billion dollars to restart the production line for the RS-25 engine. Again, that was money just to re-establish manufacturing facilities, not actually build the engines. NASA is paying more than $100 million for each RS-25 engine. With this start of funding, the goal was for Aerojet Rocketdyne to produce four of these engines per year. Kirisic said that as it builds and tests Raptors, SpaceX is rapidly iterating on these processes and producing higher quality engines. That speed is required because SpaceX's next generation Starship rocket needs a huge amount of engines. The Starship upper stage currently requires three sea level optimized Raptors and three vacuum optimized Raptors, and SpaceX has plans to increase that to nine engines total. Starship's super heavy booster is powered by 33 sea level Raptors. Orbital class versions of Starship and super heavy have never flown, let alone demonstrated successful recovery or reuse. So SpaceX has to operate under the assumption that every orbital test flight will consume 39 Raptors. Even after the reuse of Super Heavy Boosters or Starships become viable, taking significant strain off of Raptor demand, SpaceX wants to manufacture a fleet of hundreds or even thousands of Starships and a similarly massive number of boosters. To outfit that massive fleet, SpaceX would have to mass-produce orbital-class Raptor engines at a scale that's never been attempted. But it'll likely be years, if not a decade or longer, before SpaceX is in a position to attempt to create the Mega Fleet. If the Raptor 2 engines SpaceX is already building are modestly reliable and reusable, it doesn't take more than 5 to 10 orbital test flights to begin reusing Starships and Super Heavy Boosters. A production rate of one engine per day is arguably good enough to support the next few years of realistic engine demand. SpaceX's first orbital Starship launch attempt could occur as early as this month. It currently has permission for up to 5 orbital Starship launches per year out of its Starbase Texas facilities, and will likely try to take full advantage of that with several back-to-back -back test flights in a period of 6 to 12 months. This has been Kevin with Great SpaceX, and if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, my team and I will see you next time.